In the business world, the war for talent is really become, to a large extent, a war for diasporas, to create expats, but to gain repats or repatriates, those who have left the region but are now thinking of coming back. According to a major recent study published by the Social Science Research Council in the US, there is a reverse brain drain underway. In Silicon Valley, as you know, over 50% of startup companies have been founded by immigrants, particularly highly skilled Indian and Chinese talent. And many of them are now deciding to take their talents home. The survey suggests that these entrepreneurs are starting to see, feel that the grass is greener back in India and in China than it is in the US. But at the same time, as I mentioned, these diasporas in the form of repatriates, repats, can also set their own agendas. So what's fascinating to watch today is the dynamic between the Chinese sea turtles, as they're called, the as these returnees are called, and Chinese leadership. Because it is repats working for Google who have been clashing with Chinese authorities about issues related to censorship. And that's just one example of how these value systems can be contested, shift, and differ even within this community. And so China, India, the Persian Gulf states are just the most prominent examples of how great power status has been accelerated by the role of various diasporas who acquire knowledge, who provide labor, who bring innovations home. But it's now happening all over the world. It's happening in Africa, led by the South African diaspora, Nigerians, Rwandans, and Kenyans. Diasporas are actually part of some of the most fascinating scenarios we can conjure up for the coming decades of geopolitical uncertainties. Let's take a few examples. Today, when you open up the newspapers and read about the Middle East, people speak about an Iranian Shia fifth column operating across Sunni Arab countries in Southwest Asia. Could this crescent destabilize these regimes in Iran's favor? We don't know, but we're witnessing that play out every single day. And that is a diaspora issue to some extent. In North Africa today, the Arab Spring, what is going to be a crucial determinant of the political and economic fate of North African nations beyond the daily agitations, protests, and unrest? It is most certainly going to be the role of the Arab diaspora in Europe. Will they go back? Will they invest? Will they lead? That is going to determine the outcome of this Arab Spring. Again, the centrality of diaspora is there. Let's take another scenario. What if China decides to offer dual citizenship one day, maybe not in the next decade, maybe not in 20 years, but one day to offer dual citizenship to the 50 million ethnic Chinese around the region? What impact would that have on where Chinese, ethnic Chinese people hold their money? And what would loyalty then mean in an era where China has long shifted from being a communist pariah to being a respected superpower? To come back to the Middle East, what if the South Asian diaspora, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and other, come together to collectively demand a greater political voice in the Gulf states that they have called home? What impact would that have on the political stability and economic fortunes of those countries? That could be an intense geopolitical scenario for the coming years. And within South Asia itself, of course, we've seen that the Indian and Pakistani diasporas, particularly business people, have cooperated in track two diplomatic dialogues to boost cross-border economic cooperation. There's no doubt that such exchange has to deepen for there to be long-term peace and stability in the region. In May 2011, earlier this year, the US State Department held a diaspora's, de de development, diaspora's Diplomacy and Development Conference. And they focused on a wide set of issues, including food security, disaster response, promoting entrepreneurship, education, remittances, media, technology, youth, and sports. These are serious and concrete examples of diasporas making a major contribution in all of these areas. And they're very necessary on a global scale. It will take significant contributions of the Afghan, Pakistani, and, other, and, and their diasporas around the world to pr provide remittances, talent, and investment to jumpstart the economies of this troubled part of the region. 
And so these are just some of the scenarios for geopolitical futures and proposals for how diasporas can make positive contributions to intractable problems that intimately involve the role of diasporas. And we could think of many, many more. No doubt this conference is going to shed light on the many ways in which diasporas can continue to be a very important force for good in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khanna, for an extremely stimulating presentation. I'm sure it has given a lot of us food for thought, and there would be uh, questions during the QS.